right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Chris Brogan of Chris Brogan Media. And you're in Boston today, correct, Chris? Yes, sir. Um, Chris, uh, if you haven't heard of him, is the author of um, nine books and counting, if I'm correct, uh, best-selling New, uh, New York Times author. He is a well-renowned, sought-after speaker um, and obviously prolific writer. And one of the things that I wanted to talk to Chris today about was uh, evolving customer experience, particularly as a, as a competitive advantage, because as we know, we live in an era of commoditization. There's a lot of noise out there. It's very hard for companies to really stand out or differentiate themselves with prospects and customers. So I'm a big believer in customer experience. And that's why I wanted to get Chris's take on why is customer experience so important today? I feel like one of the changes or one of the evolutions that business has gotten into is that they just get more and more focused on their side of the equation. Me, us, our thing, our awards, all of what we have to offer, how great we'll be. Um, and I, and it's never really been, I mean, we always buy from the perspective of the buyer, right? I mean, there are zero people that say, I really can't wait to hear what this company wants to sell me today. Mm -hmm. And so I think that all of the marketing technology, the sales technology, all the tools we've built have been so pushed and aligned towards how do we push our message here? How do we uh, deliver some kind of experience there? And it's just not really tied to the way buyers are looking at what they're looking at. And, I, and I've been sort of looking at my, you know, everyone's system is so different. But my, my very simple view of the world is that an event happens and then a customer has some sort of awareness, you know, oh, you know, I, I, I broke my digital camera. I guess I got to go look and see what kind of digital cameras. Then after awareness is evaluation. Mm -hmm. Right after that's purchase. Then uh, on-ramping, meaning does the company do anything once you buy? Right. And then uh, after on-ramping would be, or onboarding, would be a retention and referral. What are we doing to keep it, you know, to keep the relationship? And I think that there are some technologies that do this better than others. There are some companies that do this better than others. But I, I would say it's very few sales or marketing professionals that are really thinking through all of those aspects. I think they're mostly spending their time on how do I break through noise and get, you know, mm -hmm. a massive kind of response, not how do I nurture a response from the person who might be in the exact position to buy what I have to, to offer. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. And I think to some degree, obviously, you know, those technologies are great. And they do. I mean, we have a CRM. Um, they're, they're great enablers when used correctly. But then some people, as you say, have gotten fall into the trap of just using like marketing technologies just to fire hose the whole world. Right. Right. So, so how are some of the ways that you would advise people to to be able to, as you say, nurture those relationships and kind of stand aside from the noise? Think of all the data that you could put into a customer record. Think of all the ways that you could slice and tag and segregate and segment people via a good CRM. There are so many ways to start saying, you know, I met this customer here or I met this prospect here. I know that they looked at these five pieces of information. In fact, I have data that they watched our video four times. So they must have really, you know, either the video was too confusing or they were interested or they showed a lot of people, but I have this data. So to me, you know, CRMs, people really rarely use them well. Mm -hmm. uh, salespeople fill them out sort of begrudgingly. Marketers almost never use them. And customer service uh, almost never even gets access to that. They have their own system to put their trouble reports into after someone's bought. Right. And so to me, there's all this data that's out there that's not going to one central place. There is no uh, system of record. And I think CRMs could be that. Um, I, I think that they need to evolve a little bit in sort of ways that we enter information into them. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity there. I'll, I'll get way down the pipe on that, John. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, I think another system has to exist kind of married to a CRM. So CRM, customer or client relationship management. Mm -hmm. I think the other system should be called something like a CPM, which is client preference management. Nice. Um, right. Chris Brogan, the traveler, will never, ever, 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 ever want to see your dumb museum. 
I find museums rarely tell the good story. I think museums are, you know, I went to the Viking Museum in Norway. What would you want to see at a Viking Museum? Weapons. Yeah. You'd want to see, you know, things from rape and pillage. <laughs> Vikings, uh, well, the Norwegians at least want to try to act like that never happened. <laughs> so they show you boats and wagons. Right, right. Right. So think about this as a client preference management story. Mm -hmm. What are my preferences? Not museums. We just learned that. You know, I like to eat plant based, so I probably don't need to go to your barbecue restaurant. So as you start to, to, to add to this, you can see how a CRM and a CPM yeah. could really give a very unique technology uh, experience to a potential buyer. Now, what do you do with that is, of course, how do I parse this information? How do I then send this to this segment of people? Segmentation, tagging, whatever you call it in your system. I think we are vastly underusing. I would be stunned if 1% of people who have a CRM or an email service provider use any kind of segregation and tag tagging. Yeah, no, I think that's a that's a great point, and I like the idea of the uh, the, the preference management. Um, the one of the other things that you just touched on a few moments ago is you say, okay, you know, marketing are off using their systems, customer service are probably off using their systems. Sometimes they're integrated with the CRM, sometimes they're not. So um, my big thing is about consistency of customer experience. So how do you create a consistent customer experience if? all these kind of silos are operating differently because your customer experience is really measured in the aggregate, not, not just one event at a time. Right. Right. And, and, you know, I reference that there needs to be some kind of a platform of record. There has to be some, you know, as many views as you might need fine, but you really have to have one sort of, this is really the Bible on this person. Mm -hmm. um, I stayed at a hotel that I've, I stay at a lot uh, with my fiance. We have date nights and it's interesting to me that the, there's the hotel and there's the parking garage. The parking garage is managed and operated by a different company. So when there's an argument, you know, in your head, you're on a property with a parking sure. garage, but you're dealing with two companies. And I heard a, like an argument kind of happening at the desk. And I thought, this is the dumbest thing ever. To your point, this is the silos. So this person will never choose this system again because there was no easy interaction between those two. And it should be something that, you know, for the however many dollars, you know, you get, you pay the parking garage, like that, they're losing, let's say it's a $15 dispute at the parking garage, they're losing a $300 bed with that one problem. So, so I think there needs to be sort of a, a system of record. And I, I think there needs to be a sense of, and by the way, social CRM tried to do this at the very early 2000s, did not do very well. But somewhere there has to be sentiment, yeah. there has to be kind of a status, and there has to be an overall sense, this customer seems happy, this customer seems happy and spends a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just don't have that data. I am forever stunned that uh, it seems like it's my, it's like a world of amnesia, mm -hmm. even at the places where I'm a very frequent customer, and, I, and I'm depressed beyond end. And yet, I can go to a coffee shop more than three times and they'll say, oh, you like cold brewed iced coffee? And I say, yes. And that's a human behind a desk with no system. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know. We have data, John. We just use it so poorly. Yeah. And, and I love that example of the, the parking guards there because I guarantee you if you sat down with the executives or whoever manages owns that hotel or that property – um, and you said, and you talked about customer experience. They probably wouldn't even dawn on them that the that going in and out of the garage is actually a customer experience, right? Quite an important right. one, actually, for most of us, because let's face it, parking at hotels can be a bit of a nightmare. But but they wouldn't see that because they're not seeing the totality of the interaction, right? Exactly, and and partly it's 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 masked because of the fact that it's two different companies, um, and, and to your in their mind they did a great thing because you know we're not experts in parking. Sure, we'll leave this to this other entity. Uh, there's so many uh, sales and leadership books that say you know let expertise lie on someone else's hands. I, I don't care what book you read if the customer isn't the the central story point mm -hmm. of your business's entire existence, you're doing something wrong. Yeah. You know, I, I also agree with Henry Ford and Jobs who said customers don't know what they want. But you, you could say that as a negative or you could say it as, you know, wow, have I got a chance to really help a customer and facilitate, you know, a better experience than they ever could have imagined. Yeah. 
But they sure know what they don't want, which is they don't want a crappy, yes. crappy experience, right? And they certainly True. don't want to be had. So here's another interesting thing when I was reading um, some of what you talk about is, um, you know, from a technology point of view, right, people are leveraging now artificial intelligence and chatbots and all that. How do you do that effectively without... Uh, the, you know the consumer on the other hand, on the other side going ah oh, I'm on a chatbot I mean this is not even a real person how do you how do you how can you or can you use that effectively so there's been some really early wins on this and there's still the the verdict is out on whether or not we the people are going to be okay with chatbots my opinion is that anytime we have one early uh, feedback is always negative no matter what you know this is terrible why would you ever get away with humans but it's sort of like boiling frogs. You know, you do it one degree at a time and everyone goes, okay, fine. This is how it is. People didn't like the idea of ATMs, mm -hmm. which I thought was so silly because it, it restricted access to my bank. You know, I need my money when I want it, not when you're open. And I think chatbots are the same. But uh, Hotels.com, I think Kayak.com, both travel companies, have uh, some early indications that people are willing to deal with a chatbot and excited to deal with a chatbot if it facilitates an experience that's easy for them. Mm -hmm. So right now, a uh, kayak, for instance, has a bot that you can implement on something like Slack. So a lot of offices now use Slack for internal comms. Mm -hmm. And I can go to kayak on Slack and say, what's the easiest flight from Boston to Dublin right now? And it'll give me two or three options back. And I can click A, B, or C and start booking a flight never having gone to a website, never having to sift through a lot of data and just pick it fast. And when a chatbot allows us to facilitate a really easy interaction, we like it. When it feels like we're talking to yet another answering machine, we don't. Yeah. So I, I think the implementation challenge is how human can we make this? How simple and throughput like will this feel like? Or um, how can we make sure a customer can have really simple access to a human agent if necessary? I, I think that, you know, the dawn of voice response units in the 80s and 90s, um, I, I think we're still being tortured by these. <laughs> I, I can't think of a, a business phone call a week we're in which I don't have at least one phone call with a phone tree somewhere where I have to press seven if I know origami or something. Yes, no, absolutely. And then you uh, you have to put in your account number, and then when you get through to the person, eventually they ask you for your account number. Oh, uh, John, there, there's <laughs> nothing more miserable than that feeling. I, I make a really kind of crass joke about this. I am stunned that urinals know that I'm there, have done my duty, and left. <laughs> But it seems like most companies know less than that urinal about the fact I'm there. So I, you know, I had a very positive experience, I want to say. I called a, a tire company here called Sullivan Tire, and I wanted to get some brake work done that they had recommended to me a few months back. He, the, the guy was able to, from my phone number, pull, without me asking me, he just saw it on his little ID, pulled it up and had all the records, knew exactly what I was talking about, said, this is Chris, right? I said, yes, it is. It was beautiful, and it was the most minimal technology in the world. Mm -hmm. He matched the phone number on caller ID to the phone number in the CRM and gave me a beautiful experience. I booked the I booked the appointment the day after. He didn't have to ask for the sale. I asked for the sale. <laughs> That's what I want. Yeah, and I think this is getting back to what you um, said at the outset about – um, that we have to look at it through the, the buyer's um, eyes. So as you say, yeah, I'd be fine with the chatbot if it made life easier for me. If I think it's making life easier for you, the, the seller, uh, at the expense of me, then I'm not so impressed. But I, I also, uh, when you have, it's funny because I, I've now turned into one of these people. When I have a good customer experience and I'm wowed or whatever i immediately will go and do the survey or whatever they send me and leave them you know um because i'm so surprised at this. right and i think a lot of people are missing out on that i think the whole customer experience um piece but but that was a great example that you used where it's simple because the guy made you feel important and also um was knowledgeable saved you time right Right. Seen and understood. You know, I don't even have to feel like, you know, godlike. I don't have to feel like there's a velvet rope and, you know, VIP and here's your goblet of wine, Mr. Brogan. Yeah. I just want to feel like th th they know that I exist, that, that I've been a frequent customer of their business. I would certainly like that to be in some way indicative of what I will or won't choose next, etc. And I think that 
um, when people push back on this, when someone watches this, John, and they yeah. say, you know, oh, we couldn't do that. I'll, <laughs> I'll go back to that Sullivan Tire example. He had sales records, basic. And if you don't have those, you're, I don't understand how you could be a customer, mm -hmm. a company. Yeah. And he had a caller ID to match against something. Now, there's no magic in that. There's no wild, zany spaceman technology. <laughs> that is all 1990s technology. Yeah, yeah. And, and so it's never, uh, but we don't have the tech to do it. Yeah. It's never, but we could never figure out that process. It's about the will. It's, truly. It's, truly. It's about the will and it's about um, as it, that communicates what your concept of, of customer experience, i.e. if you do it well like he did. Um, it shows you that that company understands it and cares about it. if you don't do it, where the other ones where you hide behind your phone tree and make it impossible to get some. I had this lovely experience recently. There was this website that was updating its its profiles, right? And I needed to get something updated. And when I went on to update it, it said it gave me a number to call. It said, you know, you can't do this online. You need to call. So I called and the the message told me I couldn't do it on the phone. I needed to go to the website. And this went on for two days. <laughs> John, I had something like that, but it, when you hear the source, it's even worse. It was I wanted to cancel the paper part of my subscription to oh. the Wall Street Journal. Uh -huh. I wanted just the digital. Yeah. It took three departments to close that, and I said I cannot be the first human on the earth mm -hmm. to to cut their subscription in half because the papers were stacking up unread. Yeah, and they were like. Oh, no. I mean, there's a process, sir. And I was like, yeah, but your process is in no way geared towards your buyer. Uh -huh. You know, like it makes me want to cancel the whole thing. And they're like, <laughs> oh, don't do that. And I said, but, but you make it so easy for me to want to. Yeah. And so I don't know. I think when people see this interview, I hope that what they most come away with is just the realization that th these are choices that all companies have to make. Yeah. And, and all your buyers all have a choice. And they're going to choose the one that makes them feel like they're the most connected to the business. And these are, and as you said, I mean, these, this has got nothing to do with technology. These are simple yeah. choices about how you want to, how you want to make people feel. And I think just in, in, in the last point here, um, I don't know what it is, but it's like, we forget, we forget that we're consumers and buyers ourselves. Sometimes when we put in processes for our buyers, processes that if we were on the other end of it, we'd be like, well, I'm never dealing with this company. Right. And, and, you know, it's one of the things. So I love email marketing. I'm an email marketing fanatic. I've, I've most of my financial success came from email marketing. And I can tell you that I always am stunned that people seem to write their email letters to their buyer as if that person cannot wait to read 3,500 words. And as if, you know, that we all are looking at it on the 27 inch monitor. And of course, we're sitting perfectly still with no distractions, only looking at your mail. Exactly. And, and I said, but you all look at them on these little black candy bars. There's not, this is what we all read them. We're on the toilet half the time reading your message. Do you think that we're waiting for your tome, your vast <laughs> Moby Dick of a sales letter? And, and so I've really been advocating to what I've been calling tiny media, little bites. Little, I, I like to say tapas, but no one likes that besides me. Um, <laughs> The, that idea of the small perfect bite is is the unit of measurement for communication now. And people will say to me back, but Chris, I have so much I have to convey. This is a very complicated sale and you're not going to earn it yeah. unless you get a few back and forths anyway. Yeah, exactly. So, so do it like that. Fantastic. Listen, Chris Brogan, this has been great. Uh, before we go, do you want to tell people a little bit more about yourself, how they can find out more about you and contact you? You know, probably the easiest is just go to chrisbrogan.com. I have a newsletter sign up right there. Grab it. And if you, within two letters, you'll know if you hate me or love me. There's a perfectly uh, free unsubscribe button right at the bottom. And I love when people use it. I would love to connect. All right. Thank you again. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. See you all again soon for another expert interview. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.